that was really fast and covered a lot of topics in way too much simplicity. Like I said at the beginning, all of this is just summarizing and simplifying what professional philosophers are saying in their professional journals. So there's lots of reading material I can recommend if you want to know more about anything that I said. But also, let's talk about some of it here. Um, anybody have questions from anything that was said or anything about atheism or morality? Yeah? She said, we don't know, so why can't we just stop at we don't know? Why attribute it to something else? But if we stop at we don't know, how can we say that it cannot be attributed to something else if we just don't know? Right. So. That's a good question. She says, why can't we say that, it sounded like you said, why would we be able to say it isn't something else instead of just saying we don't know if it's something else or not? Is that kind of where you're going? No, I'm saying, instead of saying we don't know, so it must be God, we should just stop at we don't know. Why can't we say we don't know? It may be God. It doesn't have to be, but it may be. It's a possibility yep. since we don't know at all. Yes, there are so many things we don't know about the universe. Um, the physicists in the room will correct me, but I think something like 94% of the matter and energy in the universe is something we've never seen before. Right. I mean, this is, we don't know hardly anything about 94% of reality. That's amazing. So we don't know a lot of stuff. And so we aren't justified in saying that uh, we don't know how this works, therefore it's God. We're not justified in saying that. Now, are we justified in saying we don't know how this works, therefore it's not God? I would say no. I would say we are not justified in saying that. A lot of atheists don't want to hear me say that, but I just don't see any reason to do that. Um, so I would be called, there's lots of different terms for that kind of atheism. Um, the idea here is, look, we also cannot say we don't know how this works, therefore it's not the flying spaghetti monster. That also is an unjustified leap. So when we get to that point, uh, Yahweh is sitting on the shelf next to an infinite number of extremely improbable and totally unevidenced things. So we don't know that God doesn't exist, but we have no reason to think that he does, if I'm correct about the rest of this, um, which is heavily debated. So uh, I think you're correct in that we don't want to make that leap from saying we don't know, therefore we know it's not something that we don't understand right now called God. Sorry, one more Follow -up question. question? Um, since also another thing was we don't know, we haven't seen the rest of the universe, we've only seen a very small percentage. Mm -hmm. So to say that we can't say that there is God or whatever based on our background and our knowledge kind of almost sounds very um, narcissistic of us because we used to think, as people do, like, you know, we thought the sun revolved around us because we are the center of the universe. But clearly, we're in a very tiny percentage where we don't even know what's out there. We don't know, we can't get there, so there's so much we don't know. So again, I, I mean, it's a, it's a good argument, but I think that the whole is, is that we, we, there is so much out there, and for us to say that, well, it can't be because of our background and we're not used to it, that just puts us like, oh, well, it can't be because we're in the center of it. You know what I mean? Absolutely, we're not. and so I think this should all make us very humble. We know very little. We're, we can be very proud because we know a lot more than we knew 300 years ago but we're probably at the very beginning of this scientific endeavor of suddenly finding out so much about the universe. So I think we should all be very humble about our conclusions. And so when I say I'm an atheist, I say, I don't yet see any good reasons to think that there exists Yahweh or Zeus or um, ghosts or all kinds of different things that aren't necessarily related to atheism. Um, but one reason that uh, most philosophers and scientists are atheists is what we might call the basic argument from naturalism, which goes something like this. They say, look, we don't know a whole lot about the universe, but we have found that you know, in the past, almost everything we explained with, re with resort to magic. Um, the river flooded, the gods must be angry with us. The, you, know, you give birth to uh, twins, the gods must be very happy with us. The, this is magical explanations for everything. And over time, we found that every single one of those, when we look, when we're able to look close enough at them, it turned out to be not magic. It turned out to be some mindless natural process, over and over and over and over again, thousands of times for thousands of years. And so the way that uh, Richard Carrier, who's a historian of ancient science, says this is, look, if you're betting on two horses, and you've got one horse that has lost every single one of the million races that it has run, 
and you've got another horse that has won every single one of the races that it has run, which horse are you going to bet on? And most scientists and philosophers are betting on the horse that has won every single time, the natural explanations for things, not the magical explanations for things. Now, that could be wrong. Um, you know, an example from David Hume is that uh, the chicken <laughs> lives every day of its life, and the farmer comes out and doesn't cut its head off. And then at the very end, it cuts its head off, and it was wrong the whole time. And he was wrong to infer that he wouldn't get his head cut off from the previous days. That's totally true, and that's why we should be humble about our knowledge. But we can only work from what we do know. That's our only option. And so scientists and philosophers generally think, they're, they're generally betting on the horse that keeps winning all the time. So that might change in the future. That's a contingent fact. Um, so we should be very humble about what we know, um, about what we think we know. But that's kind of the logic that has brought most scientists and philosophers to, to be atheists, as far as I can tell when I read them. Um, great questions, though. Those are really important questions. And I encounter a lot of very arrogant atheists who make amazing claims. And I don't, I don't like that from anybody, really. Uh, we're incredibly fallible. And so I, I would like to push against uh, arrogance of knowledge as much as possible from anybody. Uh, other questions? Yeah. Isn't there any evidence or study that, especially in psychology and sociology, neurobiology, that we're, we're kind of compelled to be believing beings that are kind of hardwired, want to believe, and then there's the problem of doubt, which has a psychological problem of fear. So you're trying to uh, uh, use uh, or construct something to address this, I think, subconsciously. I was wondering, in your research, have you found any of this? We're, we're actually kind of wired to be believing beings. Yeah, so is there psychological research that says that we're wired to believe in maybe spirits specifically, are you asking, or well, higher not that powers? Spirits in themselves, it's the fact that the whole process of, of, of believing. Oh, okay, yeah, so yeah. this is a huge area of research, and I wish I was a psychologist, but just on my brief survey of the topic, uh, there is in human beings an incredible tendency to uh, overbelieve way beyond the evidence that we have because this makes our lives very simple and it's just it's a survival mechanism it has obvious benefits to just believe something and move forward if we had to have good evidence for all of our beliefs we would never get anything done especially thousands of years ago when the human mind was uh, evolving in the savanna of Africa and we had no science at all so it just makes sense to just believe with almost no evidence or even total evidence against it so that we can move forward and get food all those kinds of things. So yeah, that's true. Now, in addition to that, there is a lot of psychological evidence and sociological evidence that suggests that we are prone to um, have what Michael Shermer calls hyperactive agency detectors, where, um, and the way this would work in evolutionary terms, we don't have great evidence for this. It's just kind of a, a story that we tell that sounds plausible. Um, but one way it could have happened is that if you're an ancient human and you're laying on your back, sleeping, and just blazing around and you hear a stick crack in the woods, it's way better for your survival if you make the mistake of thinking that it's a lion and you jump up and your adrenaline's running and you just start going and then you're like, oh, it's just the wind, all right, I'll go back to sleep. It's way better if you make that mistake than if you make the mistake of stick cracks and you're like, it's probably just the wind, it's usually just the wind, and then you get eaten. <laughs> That's a very bad mistake for your survival. So. Because of that, we tend to have hyperactive agency detectors where we assume that everything that happens is an agent, even if we can't see the agent, and that's where invisible agents come from, like God. 